Well, I'm still in the series of the power of thankfulness. How many people get in a revelation that thanking God will stoke your faith up? Amen. And we need, we need to be always thanking God. We, you know, in this series, we talked about how Lucifer fell from grace because he got lifted up in pride. He forgot that it was God's grace that kept him up. We, we got to keep remembering it's God's grace that keeps us up. We can't get in pride. Amen. And we found out that, that uh, Lucifer was the worship angel uh, in heaven. And we know that God created us and he created us for fellowship, but he also created us to worship him. Amen. So it's, it's a love relationship. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm in a love relationship. Amen. Glory to God. And so it's all about relationship. Amen. And so we're in it, in this series of power of thankfulness, and we've been discovering a lot of different things. But we are uh, on the uh, scriptures we've been going with uh, all this month uh, is 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Uh, it says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say that. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So victory, it, it, he's, it's in the present tense. So God is not going to give us the victory. A lot of times we sing songs like God's going to do something in our lives. But we really need to sing the songs in, in the now. Amen. God is doing things in our lives. He's moving. Amen. So the power of thankfulness gives us victory for today and for the future. I like what it says in Hebrews 11.1. 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You could actually say it this way. Now thankfulness is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In other words, when you start thanking God, I'm preaching today. When you start thanking God for his promises, then pretty soon his promises starts coming alive into our lives. You're thanking God ahead of time. Because it says now faith is. Faith is always in the now. So you start thanking God ahead of time and you will see it come into your life. It brings the substance of the things that you're believing for into manifestation. So in other words, maybe you're dealing with a financial deficit. Thank God that God is supplying all my needs. Maybe you're dealing with some pain in your body. Thank God by Jesus stripes I am healed. You, you add thankfulness to the scriptures. Yes. Amen. Not just quoting the scriptures, but add thankfulness that the scriptures of God is working in your life. You, Can I get a witness in the house today? Amen. Now, I like it says in 2 Corinthians, it says in 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now, thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. So we see this, it is powerful. It reveals that thanksgiving gives us a triumphant life. Amen? So it always, and, and the word always means always. So God is always causing. So it doesn't matter what the setback may look like in your life. God is working things out. Now say it this way. Say, say this after me. Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph. In Christ Jesus. So he's working in our life. God is causing things to work out in our life, even though it may not look like that they're working out in our life. God's working it out. I love this scripture in Romans because we can trust God. Look at your neighbor and say, trust God. You can trust God that God is working things out in your life. Because I like what it says in Romans 8, 28. And we know that Paul wrote this. And Paul went through all kinds of problems in his life. You know, he ended up in jail. He ended up getting beat. He ended up shipwrecked. He ended up snake bit. He had all kinds of problems. But Paul always walked in victory, even though he was dealing with problems. Why? It was all an attitude. It was all in how he thought about things. And so he knew that God was with him no matter what it looked like. And in Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that all things... Somebody say all things. all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according 
to his purposes. So we see here that God is working all things out for good that for those who love God. How many people out here love God? Amen. 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 Now, even though the devil might try to work some things out against our lives, you know, the devil's working against us, but whatever the devil is trying to do against us, God is working things for us. Amen. Amen. And whatever the devil tries to steal, the Bible says he has to repay back sevenfold. So even if the devil comes and attacks us, it's going to be a turnaround blessing for each one of us. Do you believe that today? So no matter what we may be encountering, God is going to work things out. He's going to make it better. In other words, I preached a message a few months back that God wants to enlarge our territory. So he enlarges our territory. Whenever the enemy tries to shrink our territory, God will move in. He will do things and he'll elevate us to a higher place in him. We see that all through the scriptures. And so God is working to elevate things in our life. Even though we may make mistakes, we may not get things right all the time. Uh, we, may, we, we, we may end up doing some things that may open some doors. If we just repent and thank God, keep an attitude of thankfulness, God will turn things around. So I'm going to say this, we've been discovered in our series that feeling sorry for ourselves keeps us from being thankful in God. In, in other words, having self-pity. And we, we realize this in Matthew 6, 21 through 23. We're, gonna, we're just going to just kind of kind of go uh, uh, over this just a little bit. It says here, from this time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. So, so Jesus was always trying to um, prepare his disciples that he was going to go to the cross. He was preparing his disciples. I believe he was even preparing himself that he was going to have to go to the cross for the sin of mankind. And we know that Peter took Jesus aside and in verse 22, and begin to rebuke him. Peter rebuked Jesus, and he, and he said, uh, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should happen to you. And then if you look at, if you look at the Young's translation, uh, Peter actually says, he rebuked him, he said, Be kind to yourself. In another translation, he says, Pity yourself. And so, and so we got to be very careful that we're not becoming... Uh, self-focus on ourselves when we're going through problems. We got to be make sure that we're not, you know, the, the, the problem is when we start dealing with issues, the problem is we start focusing on self. And we need to get out of focusing on self and get on focusing on others. Are, we, are you listening to what I'm saying to you today? And so, so uh, uh, Jesus here turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. So what, what uh, Jesus was doing was he gave his strongest rebuke to Peter. Why? Because, because Jesus may have been dealing with feelings of self-pity. And so Jesus will not allow self-pity to come into his life. In the New Living Translations, it says... It's a dangerous trap to me. In, in, in the uh, GW translation, it says, you're tempting me to sin. So, so Jesus basically rebuked Peter and said that self-pity is a dangerous trap. And if self-pity is a dangerous trap to Jesus, it's a dangerous trap to each one of us. It, has anyone in the house ever felt sorry for yourself? Have you ever focused on uh, that you didn't have enough? A lot of times we do that. But if you are saved, if you have Jesus in your heart, your name's written in the Lamb's book of life, and you should not be sad one day of your life. You should be rejoicing because this is not your home. You know that we're just here temporarily. You know the problems that we face are temporal. 
it, it's, it's subject to change. And we're moving on to a new place. There's reasons why we go through problems. It's called faith tests. In other words, whenever we go through issues, it challenges our faith to stand on God's word. So we can't allow, uh, allow self-pity to come into our lives. If we're going to live victorious over life, we can't be so focused on self. And, and we have to be focused on the needs of others. Amen? In Matthew 16, when Jesus rebuked Peter, he said this right after he rebuked Peter. And he said, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, he said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever, does not, whoever, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Amen. Amen. So Jesus was saying that you have to be willing. I'm talking today. I'm preaching that you got to be willing to give up your life. You got to be willing to lay down your life every day. You got to be willing to pick up your cross every day. In other words, a lot of times flesh is the unrenewed part of us that focuses on self. Flesh is always focusing on what about me? What's in it for me? What are people going to do for me? That's flesh. Flesh is always focused on self. I always call it the, the false trinity. Me, myself, and I. So we need, to, we need to make sure that we don't get this attitude that we're focused on self. When Jesus gave a parable uh, in Luke 12, 16-21... He gave a parable about the tragedy of a person thinking about self. He said it this, this way. He said that he spoke a parable to them saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns. I will build greater. And then I will store up my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And this is the attitude of the world. The attitude of the world is just focus on self. Take all your finances. Spend it all on yourself. Live your life for yourself. But God said to him, fool, that night your soul will be required of you. Then who will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So this man had judgment that came on his life. Why? Because he was self-focused. You know, the, 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 the key about Christmas, it's not about receiving. Christmas is not about just receiving gifts. Now, when you were children, it was all about what you were going to get from Santa Claus. It was all about what you were going to be blessed with. It was that list that you wrote down what you wanted from, from Santa. Anybody believed in Santa Claus in here? How many Santa Claus believers did I have in here when you were a kid? Not too many? You were a Santa Claus believer? Yeah, when you were a kid. Yeah, okay, we got some hands. All right. Praise God. And so, and so but when you, you believe and you wrote that list down, and you believe that God was going to give you something really awesome, or that, that Santa was going to give you something awesome, and he normally came through, praise God. And so, and so the bottom line is that we need a flip. We need a change from getting to giving. We need a change from what's in it for me to what's in it for others. We need a change, the, and, and, and that's when we, we come to church. We come to church when we first get saved, because we need God. We need the word of God. But in the process, I'm preaching today. In the process of coming to church, we start becoming the church. Amen. In other words, we start coming in. We start then, all of a sudden, we start working in the church. We start serving in the church. We start becoming givers, glory to God. We start giving our tithes and offerings. We realize that it's not just about receiving, but it's about giving. Christmas is not just about receiving, it's about giving. I'm telling you, uh, the other night, uh, it was Friday night, we had fasting and prayer service. 
And uh, a lot of times on Friday night, we go out. My mom and I go out after the service to break fast. And uh, we went to Ruby Tuesdays. Anybody ever eaten at Ruby Tuesdays? And uh, we went there. And normally we go there, you know, quite often. But God opened an opportunity for us to minister to the waitress that night. And, uh, and she, and she uh, was waiting on us. And we found out that she was a young mother. She's in her 20s. And uh, she had her first baby at 15. And I started ministering to her. And, and uh, her, her name uh, uh, was, man, amen. Or, glory to God. Amen. I'm going to have to make announcements. Amen. And turn your phones off when, you, when I start the service. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, she, she, as we started ministering to her, uh, she, she was a little backslidden in her walk. And, and the Holy Spirit started working. Uh, she, she, she was telling me that her, her father was in jail, that, that her father didn't believe. And her name is, uh, is heaven spelt backwards. So that was her name. And I asked if her parents were Christians. And that's when we got into the conversation. And I ended up letting her know that Jesus was for her that day. And he's for her family. He's for her dad. And, uh, and she ended up crying. We gave her a card and, and I prayed for her. And you know what? That was the best meal that I ever had. It was, I'm going to say this. It wasn't the tastiest meal that I ever had. I'm not saying that it was the... But, but me and my mom ministering to this lady, I walked away full. I walked away like, wow, we did something in the kingdom of God. It wasn't just us receiving something. It was us giving something. It's something powerful about... Giving, that's when Jesus was at the well, remember? And, and the disciples went out to get food. And the disciples went out to get food. And, and, and there was a lady at the well, the lady at the well. And, and then Jesus said, fetch me some water, get me some water. And then, uh, then Jesus started ministering to her and started telling her about her life. And Jesus revealed to the woman at the well that he was the Messiah. And she, and she received him, Jesus, as, as the Messiah. She told the whole town. She became an evangelist. And, uh, and when the disciples came back, uh, uh, they, uh, they noticed that she was talking to a lady. And, and, they, and Jesus said, you know, they said to, to Jesus, we got some food. And she said, I already had my food for today. My food is to do the will of the Father. Amen. And so really, our food is really about the kingdom. When we get caught up in doing kingdom business, when we get caught up in serving, we forget about ourselves. We forget about our problems. We, now we're focused on the kingdom. We're focused on doing things for others. And all of a sudden, God starts putting the joy in our lives. God starts putting the peace. And I've never had so much joy that I, that I had Friday night after that service. I mean, after that, at, that dinner. And so we, we see that, that victory, God wants us, gives us victory every, every time. And so if we need to make sure that we don't have a feeling of discontentment or resentment uh, towards people because that will kill the thankfulness in our hearts. It's called envy. And, and we got to be very careful that we're not envious of other people. And so I want to talk to you about a story today uh, about King Ahab. And, uh, and, and uh, Naboth and, Je and Jezebel. And it's in 1 Kings 21, 1 and 2. And we'll, we'll see in this story where self-pity and envy got Ahab and Jezebel in trouble. And in 1 Kings 21, 1 and 2, it says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, next to the place of Ahab, king of Samaria. So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a vegetable garden, because it's near next to my house. For it will give uh, you a vineyard better than it, or it seems good for you, I'll give you worth your money. So we see here that King Ahab uh, saw this vineyard of Naboth, which was right next to his, his, his kingdom, right next to his mansion. And he... And he set up in his mind that, that, that Naboth's vineyard was going to be his. He, he, knew, he, he was the king. He, 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 he felt that, that Naboth uh, would, would give him 
or sell him his vineyard. And so we see Naboth's response because, you know, he's the king. But Naboth said to Ahab, the Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. So we see here that Naboth was led by the Lord not to sell his property to Ahab. And so we know this, that, that the tribes would get a certain amount of land, and that land was divided between the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and when they got that land, that land, they were supposed to keep it to pass it down, glory to God, to uh, their, um, amen, glory to God, to, to pass it down to their children. And so we see here, so Naboth, uh, uh, Naboth knew the, the, the word of the Lord, and so he didn't sell that property. Now, Naboth was actually risking his life, really, because Ahab was a wicked king. Ahab was not a king. So he was risking his life to not sell that land to honor God. And I'm going to say this. Sometimes we're going to have to take risks just to honor God in what we believe God is telling us to do. And so Naboth stood his ground, and he didn't sell the, the land to Ahab. Now, let's look at Ahab's response. And Ahab, the king, said, So Ahab went into the house, sullen and displeased, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite has spoken to him. For he has said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers, that he may lay down on his bed. And he turned away his face, and he would not eat any food. So we see here that, that uh, Ahab actually went to bed, and he was depressed, he was sullen, he was upset, he was angry in some of the translations, he was vexed. Why? Because he didn't get his way. Ahab was focused on not get, getting Naboth vineyard. Then he, you know what? He forgot what he already had. Sometimes in this life, we can get so focused on what we don't have, we forget what we do have. I'm going to say it again. Sometimes in this life, we get so focused on what we don't have, amen, that we forget what we do have. And we think about King Ahab. What did he have? Well, King Ahab was wealthy. I mean, he, he, he possessed lands already. He said he could have gave him another land for that land. He possessed money. He had enough money to buy that land from Naboth. He possessed, you know, he, he was wealthy. He was rich. He had chariots. He had all this stuff. But he got in his mind because he didn't have uh, Ahab's land. He was missing out. And I'm going to say this. We got to make sure that we don't have a wrong attitude where we're focusing on what we don't have, which will cause us to be unthankful, which will cause depression to come into our lives. It will come, op oppression will come into our lives. And so we see this, that, that now the plot starts to thicken. Now we start seeing what this turns into. And so, but Jezebel, his wife, came to him in, in verse 5 and said to him, Why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? And he said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezelite, and I said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Now, this is interesting that he, he answered, he, he said it this way, that Ahab said that, that almost making uh, Naboth like, I don't want to sell it. But Naboth didn't say it that way. In other words, when we start focusing on what we don't have or what people won't give us, we will start exaggerating the story. And the story is really that it wasn't that Naboth didn't want to sell it to him. It was that God was leading Naboth not to sell it to him. And so sometimes we will, uh, we will say things or we will even start to lie to ourselves the reason why we should have something even if we don't have it yet. And so, and so King Ahab allowed self-pity and envy to fabricate the story of Naboth to put him in a better light and put Naboth in a bad light. So Jezreel revealed an entitlement attitude towards the king. And, and then Jezebel's wife said to him, You now exercise authority over Israel. Arise, eat food, let your heart be cheerful. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth and Jezreel. So we see here that Jezebel, you know, 
fed into his self-pity and said, you are an entitled king. And, and you, you sh basically, you should have Naboth's vineyard. And then, and then Jezebel said, I'm going to figure out a way to get that vineyard to you. And, uh, and so we need to understand this and we need to be very careful. We're not buying into the idea that we deserve things. We need a guard against that entitlement attitude. Just because we serve God doesn't mean God owes us anything. I'm preaching today. Just because, you know, we may do some things for the kingdom of God doesn't mean that God uh, has to give us something. In other words, anything that God gives us, it's by His grace. We, that keeps us in a thankful attitude. If you're not in a place where you're always expecting something from people or expecting something from God, you're going to stay in a gracious attitude. So Abba's sin was self-pity. His sin was envy towards Naboth vineyard that, that wanted to belong to him. We need to be very careful. We're not getting that attitude that if we don't have, if we don't desire, if we don't have something that we desire right now, we won't be happy. And I'm going to say this, that you won't be, ha if you're not happy before you get what you desiring, you're not going to be happy when you get it. Because eventually the newness will always rub off. Are you, are you listening to what I'm saying to you today? I like what it says in Luke 2 and 15. Uh, this is Jesus. And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Covetousness or coveting means that you're desiring something of somebody else. So he says, take heed, beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possesses. Amen. So, so this is Jesus. He's saying that our life does not consist of all the bling bling that we have in our life. Our, in other words, what we own does not define who we are. I'm preaching today. What we own doesn't define who we are. God defines who we are. And in Hebrews, uh, in, in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So here, he's saying here, don't be always desiring to get things in your life. Understand this, that, that God is with us, and if he's with us, he's our inheritance. Amen. And if he, and God is our inheritance, heaven's our home, then we need to be happy in the place that we're at. Not saying that you're not believing God for more, but saying that you need to be content in where you find yourself. Amen. Amen. And Philippians says, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned whatever state that I'm in to be content. So no matter where you're at in life, you can learn to be content. Amen. That's where Paul writes, I can do all things right after this through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, we can, we can endure anything. We can live in any state. Why? Because God is with us and he will strengthen us where we're at. Glory to God. And so we need to be very careful that our flesh, which is the unrenewed part of us, is not always trying to get, but it's our spirit that wants to give. In Proverbs 27, 20, it says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. So I'm going to say this. We can never satisfy uh, uh, our, our lust that tries to come upon us at times. It's never satisfied, but God can satisfy. God can satisfy each one of us. In Ecclesiastes, it says, Whoever loves money will never have enough money. Whoever loves wealth will not be satisfied with it. This is so useless. So we see here that we don't want to get our minds on things. We don't want to get our minds on money, but we want to get our eyes on the kingdom. Again, Ahab was wealthy. He had lands. He had servants. He, he, he allowed not getting Naboth's uh, land to, to give, put him in a low state of unthankfulness, put him into envy. And so we see that Jezebel devises an evil plan to get Naboth's vineyard. 
And, she, and it says in 1 Kings 21, 8 and 10, she wrote letters in, in Ahab's name and sealed it with his seal and sent the letters to the elders of the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and seat Naboth with a high honor among the people and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him that he may die. So we see here that, that Jezebel sets up this evil plan to, to take Naboth out. And so the plan was executed. And they did exactly as the letter was written. And they took Naboth out and they stoned Naboth. It says in verse 15, 16, And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, then Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard. And Naboth the Jezreelite, Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. So it was then when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up, went down, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth at Jezreelite. So we see here that, that, that envy, that a, a attitude of, uh, of entitlement, that this self-pity attitude turned into lying, turned into murder, turned into stealing. This sounds a lot like the devil, doesn't it? So whenever we start, go, we start going down a bad place, when we allow self-pity, when we allow envy, when we allow an entitlement attitude to get into our lives. And so we see here that Ahab now is trying to take possession of the land. And I'm going to say this, that God's eyes are not blind to the evil that people do in their lives. And so we see here that God's judgment comes on King Ahab. It says in 1 Kings 21, 17, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishabite, saying, Arise, go down, meet Ahab, king of Israel, who lives in Samaria. There he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered? Also taken possession. And you will speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, dogs shall lick, lick your blood, even yours. And so, and so down further into what uh, the prophet said to uh, Ahab, he started telling him that his, his family line would not inherit the kingdom. And he said, even Jezebel will die a gruesome death. And this was judgment of God on, on Ahab and, Je and Jezebel for what, the, what they did. Amen? And so, and so but this is interesting. Uh, we can avoid judgment if we do what Ahab did. And Ahab, down in the verse, Ahab heard these war words. He tore his clothes. He put sackcloth on his body. He fasted and laid sackcloth and went about mourning. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah to testify, saying, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity on his days. In the days of his son, I will bring the calamity on his, ha on, on his house. So we see here that, that even though Ahab was a wicked king, he, he had enough sense to repent. And when he repented, uh, this is amazing, even how wicked Ahab was, God had mercy on Ahab. And I'm going to say this, maybe we've been in a state of, of uh, feeling sorry for ourselves. Maybe we've been in a state of, of coveting other people's stuff. Maybe we've been in a state of, of doing the wrong things. Well, if we repent, if we turn from that, God will bless us. His grace will come back on us. He will restore what we have. He will bless uh, the, every area in our lives. And so, uh, so, so this is amazing. Ahab repented. And when we turn from being self having self-pity and saying, Lord, I'm going to start being thankful. I'm going to start being grateful. I'm going to start giving you thanks, regardless of what it looks like in my life. When you start doing those things, you're going to see the grace. You're going to see the blessings. You're going to see the goodness of God in your lives. Did you receive it today? Praise God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your mercies and for your goodness and for your love. I thank you, Father God, that your word is working mightily in our lives. 
And Father, perhaps there's those that are here in the audience today or those watching online. And perhaps you haven't received Jesus. You haven't turned yourself to the Lord. And today is the day of salvation. Just ask Jesus in your heart and you will have that grace that God promises you. Just say this out loud and mean your heart. Say, dear God, I believe Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you were raised from the dead for my justification. Today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. And Heavenly Father, fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.